Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Leadership Institute's webinar on You Can Lead Without Authority with Pat Patricia Simpson. Today we are broadcasting to you live from the Leadership Institute's headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. If you have any questions during today's live webinar, please let us know. You can tweet at us. Our Twitter handle is at Leadership Inst, I -N -S -T. and if you use our um, hashtag LI webinar, we'll be able to find you very easily. You can also email us at live at leadershipinstitute.org. Today we have Patricia Simpson, our Director of Political and um, Career Trainings. She actually happens to be quite wonderful, quite beautiful, and my boss. <laughs> um, she's here. Continue. <laughs> um, prior to being our, our Director of Political and Career Trainings, she was our direct director of online trainings, and before that, the deputy, deputy director of grassroots. She's also the from Rome, New York, and the biggest Red Sox fan I know. So I'm turning it over to Patricia Simpson. Yeah, did you hear that, Pache? Biggest <laughs> Red Sox fan. Uh, Ainsley, thank you very much. I will not fire you today, so thanks. Uh, so I'll get straight to the point. Most of us do not run our own organization. We don't run our own company. We're not, certainly not the ones who sign the checks. If you are, more power to you. Why are you watching this webinar? This webinar is for those of us who are not in charge yet, or we just have not found our voice, and we need some tips. Well, I'm here to give you those today. I have about five different tips for you, but first I wanna start off by asking Ainsley a question. Ainsley, what are the qualities of a leader? When you think of a leader, what, do you th what qualities do you think of? I think of somebody who can automatically take charge of a situ situation and really kind of both control the team and direct them mm -hmm. in a positive manner. I think of a good leader as somebody who takes everybody's strengths and uses them to their best advantages. All right. What, what are some other just personality traits that you think of? I think of outgoing, extroverted. Um, I think of most of the presidents we've had, so a little bit cocky, too. <laughs> outgoing and extroverted. Now, a lot of you watching this webinar, I'm sure, do not consider yourselves particularly that outgoing and certainly not extroverted. Uh, I would say that over half of my peers here at the Leadership Institute are introverts themselves and don't naturally think of themselves as leaders. But when I watch them and how they interact with their coworkers and their subordinates and their, their superiors, I see that they are truly leading without authority just based on some of the ways that they uh, finesse situations and the way they approach situations. So while most people think of a very outgoing personality or an extrovert is a leader, you don't have to have those particular qualities in order to be an effective leader, and especially to be an effective leader without having that title of you know, supervisor, boss, director, vice president, president, uh, CEO. What obstacles can get in the way, do you think, from being an effective leader? I'd say maybe a team member who kind of pushes back mm -hmm. a little bit of a, against your decision making, um, having obstacles placed in front of you that you've never faced before, things of those nature. Right. So you're going to have a lot of things that make you feel like you could lead, but you're going to have a lot more things that make you feel like you can't. And why are there more things that make you feel like you can't? One of them starts off with you don't have the title. Now, a title does not determine your worth within a company. Sure, it may determine your salary, but it doesn't determine whether or not you have a voice at the table or within a project. So the first thing, the first tip of the five is going to be see yourself as a leader. You have to have confidence in your abilities. You can't assume that anyone else is going to have confidence in you if you don't have confidence within yourself. It's the old, you know, it's people see you the way you want people to, to see you. And that's kind of true. If you are not a very confident individual, individual, but you kind of fake that confidence, other people around you are going to think that it really is true confidence. It's the kind of fake it until you make it mentality is that you can, you can use that in your day-to-day -day activities at work. Whatever task that you're assigned, you need to become an expert in it. 
If someone asks you to write a thank you letter to a donor, you need to do all the research you possibly can on what are the most effective thank you letters, what are the most touching, the most heartfelt, and the most meaningful. Be the best thank you letter writer that you have on staff. This is usually a, a job, a task that is assigned to an entry level person. If you do the research and notice that other organizations have a better retention rate on their donors and you think it might correlate with the fact that their thank you letters are written differently, you, since you are now an expert in that one task, you can bring that up to your superior and say, I've noticed through market research, and again, this is something as simple as a thank you note, something that, while simple, means so much to other people. You then, because you are an expert and you have seen yourself as a leader on a particular issue, can present this to your superior. And because you are the expert and they know that you've done so much research on it, you are leading without the authority of being your boss, without the authority of being in charge of the development program at your organization, but you're leading because you are seen as the person who knows the most about this issue. That is one way to lead without authority. I know that in my past positions is that I try to learn as much as possible as I can about a particular issue, become an expert on it. So when there is a chance to have my voice heard at the table, I can guarantee that it will be heard and that it will be based upon facts and will have supporting evidence. So that way the other people who are there, my superiors, will listen to me and that they will actually take into account what I have to say. And often I will have a way to push my agenda along, which is good for the organization, but it's also good for me and it shows that I truly can be a leader without actually having the title. Fantastic. Um, yeah. So we have one moment. Oh. I see what's wrong. <laughs> I don't have it on slideshow on my computer. Next thing that you want to do is you want to be as connected as possible. And I don't mean this in the frivolous DC sense of the word, meaning know everyone and you know, you're the person that everyone has to know and you're so popular and you can do so much for other people. That's not what I mean. I mean have a very strong network, a network of individuals that truly can help you move anything along within your current position. A good manager appreciates when their subordinates have contacts that can help a project be successful. So if, you know, if you're working at, say, the Leadership Institute and you're working in one of our training departments, I'm going to value an employee who knows a lot of people at organizations throughout the country who can help get contacts so we can put trainings on around the country. That network makes you an authority figure on the contacts within that state or within that industry. I'm going to make you the go-to person, the go-to coordinator on staff that anyone goes to seeking for advice based on, let's say you have an amazing contact base in Texas. You are now the authority figure on staff for anything that has to do with Texas. If there's a donor meeting coming up and our development team doesn't know that much about a donor or it's a prospective donor, then we're going to have that person who's from Texas let them know this is what the landscape is like there. This is what attitudes are like there. This is the place where people go to eat, go to restaurants. Uh, this, is, this is what you know, they talk about at the diner after church on Sundays. It's, you want to, if you are connected and you have a truly strong network, then there's a really great chance that your supervisors are going to listen to you. So that is another way that you can lead without authority. Do we have any questions so far? We don't, but just a reminder, you can tweet at us at, at leadershipinst, I-N-S-T, or you can actually tweet at Patricia Simpson, at Patricia Simpson, P-A-T-R-I-C-I-A-S-I-M-P-S-O-N, and use the hashtag LIWebinar to ask questions, or you can email us at live at leadershipinstitute.org. An interesting story about the Leadership Institute's Twitter handle and my own is that when Twitter first uh, launched, I heard about it. I got my own name. That's why I have Patricia Simpson, which is a pretty difficult name to get. Uh, and I got the Leadership Institute's Twitter handle. Seems silly, but because I got there first and I did the research on it, it's okay, well, we're going to listen to Patty. 
<laughs> and it's, I mean, that was six and a half years ago that this happened, but it's one of those things where if you jump on something first, if you become an expert early, an expert, because I by no means am one, but I spoke with confidence about it, uh, that it now, you know, people will start to listen to you. No. Oh. Patricia, I actually have a question for mm -hmm. you. We've seen past interns who have actually um, utilized the networking very, very well specifically within their own state because they were involved in student groups and eventually became state chairs of different mm -hmm. organizations. Can you speak a little bit about how to do that if you're significant and what you would consider lower on the totem pole? Do you mean based on going back to your own state or if you're staying in DC? If, for instance, if someone out there is uh, in, in a California or North Dakota, how would they start reaching out across their state to developing their network so they can well, developing your network is really just a matter of making a list, making a matrix of the types of individuals that you yourself should know to help not only yourself, but to help your organization, help your cause along. You need to figure out what is the purpose of your network? What is, what is it going to serve? Is it going to help you get a project moving along to eventually succeed and finish it? Is it to get yourself a new job? Is it, uh, is it to a, an elect? to elect someone who's running for office. Uh, once that happens, you can really develop a matrix and start plugging in names after a little bit of research. And once that happens, is it's a matter of doing the legwork, the hard work, the finding out what their Twitter handles are and tweeting at these people and getting involved that way, uh, setting up informative interviews at these organizations or companies that these individuals work finding out networking receptions and networking events within communities around your state, around your own town, of places where you can go and meet these people who will eventually be a part of your team. And I say team not meaning a permanent team, but anything in life, such as it is in politics, is about forming a coalition. And once you have this coalition, your network, then you can then move forward and have truly have that network that your supervisors will not, I don't want to say be envious of, but to really appreciate because what the contacts you have are not just helping yourself, they're also helping anything that you're a part of. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. And we actually have a question. Mm -hmm. What is your advice for dealing with micromanaging coworkers and supervisors? Well, a micromanaging coworker is something, as soon as that happens, is you can, I mean, you can do one of two things. You can get really angry and pitch a fit and that gets nothing accomplished. All it does is makes you angrier and it then escalates the situation with your coworker. First, I don't understand why a coworker would be micromanaging you. Uh, if, if it's someone who is within your direct department, you talk directly to your supervisor and ask for some advice. Uh, and that will actually bring me into my third point in a moment. Um, this is a great transition is when you have a micromanaging boss, there's a reason why often why your, your supervisor is a micromanager and it's because they don't trust you. They don't trust you because they don't think that you have solutions to problems. So they then have to present the solutions to you all of the time and check and make sure that you are doing things correctly. My point, my third point, and I say this to anyone who's ever worked for me and anyone who works for anyone else, it's do not when presenting a problem, make sure you always present a solution to go along with that problem. Your supervisor is not necessarily going to agree with your solution every single time, but they will be so appreciative that you have come up with a solution, that you are thinking, that you're doing critical thinking, that you're being creative, that you're thinking outside the box, that you're doing the legwork that doesn't, I mean, anyone can report a problem. That's, that's easy. It's anyone can complain. Complaining is the easiest part about life. Uh, the hardest part is finding out a solution. It's being a hard worker, being, I, know, I guess, surviving, getting, getting over that hump. Once you start doing that, your, your supervisor probably will stop micromanaging you. And if they continue to micromanage you, do whatever you can to honestly find a new job. It's if it bothers you that much, you are not tied to your job unless you are stuck uh, where you have signed a contract and you would, there would be legal proceedings against you, or if you're in the military, uh, if you've chosen that and you do have to serve for a few more years, there really isn't much you can do that way, but you can always find a new job. 
The best way, though, to handle any micromanaging situation is to show results and show your problem-solving skills. That really is the best advice, truly the best advice I can give anyone. Anyone who, because once you start presenting solutions, your, your supervisors don't want to come up with these problem-solving things on their own. It's, they have a full plate of other things that they're, that they're dealing with. They want you to come up with these problem-solving these, these problem skills and having these solutions to the, to the problems that you're presenting because these are already the tasks that you're doing. Come up with the solutions. And once you present a solution, chances are they're going to listen to you because they don't want to have to sit there, unless it's so blatantly obvious that we cannot do that. We, we're not going to fix the problem that way. You know, if someone comes to you and goes, well, I got a real good idea and it's something illegal, we're obviously not going to do that. But if it's something that's reasonable, then your supervisor is absolutely going to say, that is a great idea, execute it. And therefore, your, your idea, you're leading without being the boss. You are leading, you're pushing your agenda, your problem solving skills, your solutions forward that you wouldn't normally have gotten to do because that micromanaging boss didn't trust you. And this time, they're starting to trust you. That's, it's, it's truly about building trust. And we have actually one more question, mm -hmm. if you'd like. How do you overcome the perception of others in order to lead them? Ah, so it's, all right. There are two scenarios. There are going to be people who already know you, and they already have what they think you are or know you are, and it's going to be really difficult to get over that reputation, uh, if we assume it's bad. If it's good, then, I mean, you've got a, got a pretty easy track record. Um, if it's bad, we'll have to talk offline about <laughs> <laughs> reputation, damage control, and uh, reputation management. But if people have never met you before, and you're just coming in brand new, it actually brings me to my fourth point, which is, these are great questions. And it's, act like you've been there before. These people do not know that you have never uh, led a situation like this or handled a situation like this or done a project like this. I mean, think about it. They're, everyone who's ever done anything, that's probably the, there's always going to be a first time that they've done something. And a lot of times it's trial and error, but the best way to get through it is to do it with confidence. It's, oh, I have, I have this, you know, I, I absolutely know how to do this. I worked on a campaign uh, years ago that I got a pretty great high up title. One that I probably 100% did not deserve, but it's, someone asked me who was another senior staff member who was quite a bit older than me and said, Hattie, how, how do you know how to do all this stuff? And I said, well, let you know a little secret. I don't know how to do it. It's that I've observed other people doing it and because I've seen other people do it or I've seen people do it incorrectly, I just, I have, there's no time, there's no learning curve. It's, I mean, this is campaign time. There's no, no time for any, uh, any confidence issues in myself. So it's just, I go ahead and I forge ahead and just got to act like I've been here before and I've done it before. And they're like, they said, well, you're doing a really good job. Um, my parents tell me that I have truly earned my BS degree in college. Uh, but it's, if you take charge and tackle the problem head on, um, without any hesitation, individuals are much more likely to listen to you and allow you to lead them because other individuals might not have the confidence. And like I said earlier in the beginning was you can fake confidence and eventually it'll just become second nature to you. And it's not lying. It's just if no one else is going to take on that responsibility, one of you in the group has to. And it's even if you learn together, be the person who's the leader of that group. And like I said, people will start listening to you. Um, let's see. One, six. Sorry. Just, uh, you sure there are no other questions from the audience? Not yet. Wow, you guys, you guys must, I must be doing <laughs> a really good job. Um, all right. So let's get to who are truly effective. And people who are truly effective are one of seven people. 
You have one, people who are experts in a specific domain. You, so who are experts? I mean, we're going to talk people who, in the conservative world, people who work for Heritage or Cato, people who write white papers on specific topics. Uh, Morton Blackwell, our president and founder, I would say that he is 100% an expert on grassroots organizing and training, uh, the training of political technology. Early adopters. Remember I said that when I, I had a Twitter handle first, so LI took that Twitter handle. It's early adopters and those who can build relationships uh, with them to move change, change through, those are true experts. Opinion leaders. Opinion leaders are effective. Who are opinion leaders? These are people who appear on Fox News or CNN, people who write for Red State or for very popular blogs. These people are opinion leaders, they're opinion makers. People listen to them and anything they say, for the most part, is that a lot of people will not question it. They will just go along with it. Uh, people who are knowledgeable about the issues being dealt with, again, these are much like experts. People who are viewed as trustworthy. Think of someone who you trust, you would trust with your life. And then think of someone who is a quote unquote expert or knowledgeable. If the person who's trustworthy said, you've got to believe me, we can definitely walk across this 100 foot bridge and it will not collapse. And if the person who is an expert said, you got to believe me, we cannot walk across this 100 foot bridge, it will collapse. You will have a really tough time figuring out which one you want to believe. It's, first of all, I'd say, what am I doing in this scenario? I would never be <laughs> at a place where I had to cross a 100 foot bridge. Uh, but you'd have a really tough time trying to decide if you're going to believe the trustworthy person or you're going to believe the knowledgeable person. Because oftentimes it comes with emotions. It's not, we think with our heads and our hearts. The times that you think with your hearts, you're going you're gonna to go along with that trustworthy person. When you're thinking with your head, it's with uh, the knowledgeable person or the expert. So it really does depend on the people who you're trying to lead, which is more persuasive. Uh, people who have a vast network and those, those who you view as being connected, those are very, very effective in leadership roles. And this one is fantastic. The one that I like the best, especially when it comes to life in Washington, D.C., is people who use their knowledge and connections to help others. They're connectors of people. They're not the ones who are out there just for themselves, but it's, they've helped so many people, and they are knowledgeable on a lot of subjects that people are more apt to listen to them in leadership uh, role settings. So if you can be that type of person, I mean, and you can be knowledgeable and be a connector outside of your nine to five job. If you're doing that, then you are 100% more likely to be effective as a leader outside your position or even within because you become that truly connected person. So your steps to influencing. You need to realize that everyone is a potential ally. It's Politics makes for strange bedfellows. It's been said time and time again. Uh, who is your, you know, considered your enemy today could very well be your political ally tomorrow. It's, you need to approach every situation and every person as a potential ally and truly be, I mean, not just kind, but open to the idea of working with them at some point. Be clear about your goals and objective. This is about being honest. It's you being a quote unquote shady person uh, someone who's dishonest, someone who lies to others, someone who's misleading, not only in their character, but in their actions. This is not someone who is a very effective leader. They can do it once, but they can't do it again. Unless they're a cult leader, and if that's the case, then they're going to be leading these people, usually off the deep end. But it's, that is a way uh, that you can be dishonest. But in the real world, it doesn't really work. People who are empathetic, who can truly put themselves in other people's shoes, are fantastic leaders. A lot of people will do whatever someone who is empathetic says because someone who is empathetic can talk to another individual as if they're talking to a mirror. It's, it's very reflective. They're putting themselves in those 
people's shoes. They're putting themselves in that situation and they're saying exactly what that other person needs to hear. Uh, what is the most important thing for you and them? You need to think about those. Is You need to work at a mutual goal and that really means learn the art of give and take and don't be afraid to give in a situation because you know that you'll eventually take at some point. And I always, I mean, we have this word altruism and it's doing something selflessly with not getting anything in return. And I truly believe that there's no such thing as altruism because even if you get a little bit of a warm, fuzzy feeling in it, you're still getting something back for yourself. Uh, it's knowing that you've done something good. So try to be as close to the word altruistic as possible <laughs> at times, but know that you will take at some point. And that's not because you're a bad person, but it's because that's the way the world works. The, most things are reciprocal. So if you are doing a lot for others, eventually when you do ask for that favor or you do ask for something or you ask them, come with me. I want us to go do this. I want you to come work on this campaign. I want us to work on this issue. It's very important to me. It's a great, uh, great skill to have. Now we've talked a little bit about how to influence your current job, and we mm -hmm. talked a little bit about coming into a brand new situation. And I'm actually very ex excited to ask this question. But um, we have a question. I wonder if anyone at LI could recommend to me what jobs might be available right now. Well, the reason <laughs> I know why Ainsley is really excited about this question and she could probably answer it for you. Here at the Leadership Institute is we offer all sorts of career consultation uh, opportunities. We have one-on-one -on -one career consultations. We have resume consultations where we critique your resumes. If you want to work on a cover letter, we can do that. If you want to practice your interviewing skills, you can do that. But perhaps the most important exciting thing that we have here at the Leadership Institute is a little website called conservativejobs.com and that website lists hundreds of open job openings right now and we have well over a thousand job seekers uh, but if you find a job opening on there and they're not just here in Washington DC they truly are all around the country and if there isn't a job listed there and you are in another state we can find you connections within those states and get you informational interviews at conservative organizations in your area. And all you have to do is email us at psimpson at leadershipinstitute.org or, and I don't know if they have this Chiron ready, A. Harrison for Ainsley, <laughs> A. Harrison at leadershipinstitute.org. Or you can contact us by going to the website www.conservativejobs.com and we can get you set up that way. But yeah, if there's any other, do you have anything else to add to it? I think you covered all the finer points. I hope so. We're here to help you, so please get in contact with mm -hmm. us. Um, we have another question. We have, a, um, we have a man who'd like you to expand a little bit more on how to build a network of relationships and how that can assist you um, on the job, especially at a non-government organization. OK. I personally don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of experience with NGOs. But I have one person sitting next to me who has worked in government and who happened to use her network to land a job and has a very interesting story that I would love for her to share with you. And if she has any insight on NGOs, because I do know that her old career working on the Hill, that there was some interaction that way. Absolutely. Um Almost every industry across America has some kind of ties to Washington, D.C. So there was a lot of back and forth between, um, for instance, I worked, in a, worked for a member from a very rural area, and we worked with a lot of agriculture groups. And so meat producers is not something I would usually have exposure to. But I actually used my own network um, through applying to grad school to meet students and current professors. I had informational interviews that turned into job interviews. And through a professor who I happened to meet with, um, she taught. At, she teaches here at the Leadership Institute. She teaches fundraising for us, and happened to have introduced me to Miss Patty Simpson. And through that network, because I'd put the groundwork into expanding as much as possible, I wound up here and couldn't be happier. Yeah, it was. 
She met with Nancy, our, our wonderful volunteer faculty member. She was just a stellar lady. She met with Nancy on a Monday. Mm -hmm. On a Wednesday, she came with Nancy to the Leadership Institute to help her as she was teaching and to introduce her to me. And by Friday, Ainsley had a job offer to come work at LI temporarily. And I believe two weeks later, had a job offer to work here permanently. And that was about a year ago. So it really is your, your network. You never know what is, what's going to come to fruition. And before I get to my last point is, and as we start wrapping up a bit, is Rachel Kopeck is uh, a girl who works at the State Policy Network. Uh, and she has a great quote that I heard her say last year at a jobs panel. And it's basically, people are awesome. The only way that you're ever going to influence other people is if you learn what other people are like. What are their motivations? What, what makes them tick? What makes them happy? What makes them angry? What makes them sad? What makes them really mad? What makes them so excited to get out of bed in the morning that they will literally do anything for a cause or an organization or a candidate? So these are the things that you need to, if you truly want to be a leader, amongst men and women, you need to learn about people. And you need to learn if they are people that like that are being pushed or people who are being pulled. Uh, and figure that out. So truly, people who are being pulled, you want to involve them with things. It's you want to, you need to lead them. These are engaging people to share stories and find common ground and your communication styles match, you're collaborating, and it's just this, come with me, we're pulling you along. And it's, uh, you know, you know that there are people like that who are a, yeah, let's, let's collaborate, this is great. And then there are people who need to be pushed. These are people who listen carefully to identify other people's needs, and you need to present possible solutions to them because they're all very concerned. It's, so figure out people's styles, of communications and how they react to others. They're, if you see someone who is you know, standing by themselves and not talking to anyone, go up and talk to them. Say, hey, you know, it's, you never know what, you're, what is going to come out of a situation when the simplest thing you have to do is extend your arm with a smile on your face and say, hi, I'm Patty Simpson, it's nice to meet you. And I have met so many people, not only just in Washington, D.C., but throughout the country, just by that simple act. And it's helped me figure out what people are like, what, what personality traits they have, and what shuts them down completely, and what motivates them. And like I said before, is if you have someone who is truly empathetic and puts themselves in other people's shoes, it's very difficult to do. But if you can do that, try and do that as much as you possibly can because you will learn the motivation style of other people. And just to finish up is there are ways to deal with personalities. And that really is what it boils down to when you're going to be an effective leader and especially leading without authority. Leading, I don't like to say leading from behind because that implies that you are not succeeding. It's truly leading without authority, without having that job title that you think makes you, uh, that's what makes you be a, a leader. As if someone is a, has a very forceful personality, this is type of personality and how to respond. You need to speak with conviction, is that you truly believe in these things because it matches them head to head. If you have someone with a very brusque personality, be very brief. They're not there to sit around with the small talk. Is that they want to know right then and there. You provide them with the info, boom, done. If you have a very down-to-earth person, you need to use practical examples. There aren't these, you know, big, bright, I, you know, <laughs> ideas that people aren't quite sure of. These. Uh, experimental ideas. It's, you need to have really common sense solutions when talking to them and use practical examples. If you have someone who's very concerned, you know, we all, we've all ran into those people, well, you know, I'm not so sure about this and I'm pretty concerned about it. You need to provide reassurance and do not provide problems. Don't focus on the problems that can occur. 
instead focus on the, the everything is it's going to be fine, we've tested this, or I guarantee this is going to be okay. Um, if they're a perfectionist, you need to show them how your loose ends are going to be tied up. If they're very charming people, it's you want to avoid chit chat because you'll get caught up in it. Is that you'll start to, you'll get caught up by them. And I mean, I've dealt with very charming. I like to say that I would be the most charming person in the world if I had a southern accent. But alas, I was born a Yankee and therefore I have to be the funny girl instead of the charming girl. Uh, but avoid chit chat with people. And if someone is sensitive or insecure, you need to avoid drawing attention to their shortcomings or anything that, you know, it's, you're not that good at this, never say that. Instead, provide data on the right way to go. It's, you know, don't worry, it's 85% of the time we're gonna be fine and if, and if and if we aren't, then I've got your back. You know, provide that assurance that everything is gonna be okay. And just these, these tips that I gave you today about how to lead truly without authority is that peers are gonna follow your lead. People want to be led. It's, they want to fall in line. There's this uh, spontaneous order in, in anarchism that people talk about that people will fall in order. This, it's not going to be, you know, how did the line form the first time? Is there's a movie Dogma where they, the guy goes, oh, you know the line? I invented that. Uh, but truly, it's how did a line form the first time? It wasn't because the government got in there and said, this is now how people will form, because the line is the simplest form of order that there possibly is. Is that there's some person who became a leader that day and decided this is the way you do things. If you just start to be a leader, just think of it that way. Think, how do I become the, per the next person that invents something like the line? Because the line is just, or if anyone internationally is watching, the cue. Uh, it's, you're gonna set an example for others. And if you're, you're driven and you learn to read others, you do not need a title to be a true leader. You really don't. And speaking of internationals, we actually have a question from Mexico. Oh, how wonderful. Yes. You must be have ESP. All right. There are uh, are there any strategic differences between leaders depending on their industry, the type of organization, or anything else? Um, I mean, in my opinion, being a leader, when it boils down to it, is truly about reading personalities. It's it's about people. It doesn't matter now if you are in a at a nonprofit like we are at the Leadership Institute, or if you're at a corporation like many of my friends are. It's corporate culture and just culture within an organization is now so important that in order to get anything accomplished, you have to be able to read your peers, read your bosses, read your uh, people who report to you. And I have not run into anything except perhaps when something is super structured, such as the military where there is a defined structure uh, that really it's the different types of ways to lead don't change from industry to industry. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, this has been Patricia Simpson telling how you can lead without authority. If you came in late or if you want to watch this again, it will be available online at www.leadershipinstitute.org. We also have another webinar coming up on Wednesday, August 27th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It will be Optimize Your Online Fundraising with Tim Kacharik, hosted by Kyle Bechet. So please join us here again for uh, our next webinar. Thank you so much and have a great day.